Hi, and welcome to the Unreal Engine News and Community Spotlight. So first off, we've announced Unreal Fest Europe. We recommend you save the date from April 24th to 27th, and it's open to all Unreal Engine developers. Uh, more details will be coming soon, but keep an eye out on our Twitter and our other social channels for more details regarding location and what kinds of things will be going on at the event. Additionally, this week, uh, we're really excited for Zafari. So if you're not familiar, it's an animated episodic show that's all built in Unreal Engine 4. And the creators have actually gone through and written a nice piece about how um, their workflow, how it's saving them time and speeding up their whole process. So they previously went from being able to do just a couple renders a day to doing over or 20 renders in under half an hour. So they have a really nice uh, video set up that kind of walks through their workflow if you want to check that out and see how they're using the engine to do uh, animated cinematics. We're also excited for um, an event or took place, Build Munich happened, um, and there was a lot of discussion around the automotive industry. So we had the Mill, McLaren, BMW, Ford, Ferrari, lots of big giant OEMs discussing uh, automotive design um, and sort of their roadmap for the future regarding that, and also how they're leveraging Unreal Engine for uh, autonomous vehicles and moving that technology forward. So there's a nice recap video, definitely go check that out. And last, not, last but not least, uh, we're really excited to highlight an article uh, on 80 level written by or showcasing Peter Nikolai. He built this really beautiful library environment. It's a modular environment. Um, and he kind of walks through how he set up his blueprints, his materials, built these beautiful books and staircases. And it's just a really nice in-depth walkthrough. And so if that's your thing, if you love reading about environments and seeing those kind of processes, definitely go take a look at that. So on to our weekly Karma earners. These folks are jumping on Answer Hub, answering questions, and just supporting their community. And they're our weekly rock stars. So huge shout out to Thompson N13, VR Marco, Zlarator, Gen V, Every Nun, Shadow River, Maki Girl, S Rombots, Luos, and Delta 12. You guys are crushing it. And so for our first community spotlight, we have a project called Fractals of Destiny. So it's an action RPG game. It actually, to me, is very reminiscent of the really cool Final Fantasy style, um, very gorgeous visual visuals. These characters are really stunning, and I love all the animations and effects they've put into this. So the idea is have an open world action role playing game. It's very uh, fantastical, you know, but they want to make sure to still hold on to those realistic elements. And um, so the idea is you're going to be completing impossible missions, you know, and uh, there's just a lot of really cool design and elements going into this. And I'm excited to see where it goes. So if you check out the forum post, there's a lot of cool concept art. Definitely recommend giving that a little look-see. Our second community spotlight is an interactive kitchen for Stosa Kuchin. Uh, so Cyberglobe created, or them and their, uh, they created this scene. It's, um, Stosa is a well-known Italian brand and uh, they're from my design. And it's just a design demo that they prepared for one of their clients, but it's just a really, really beautiful scene. Uh, it's a work in progress, but um, they leveraged the DataSmith plugin to create it. And I think they're doing a really, really fantastic job and. I just like seeing, you know, all the different ways that you can utilize the engine and, you know, not just for games, but for architectural visualization and, and beyond. And our third and final community spotlight this week is actually a really cool stop motion project. Um, it's working title is Flugen and um, it's just uh, they're building it in Unreal Engine, and they're using Dragon Frame stop motion to build all the assets. So they're using their camera, taking a picture of each item uh, frame by frame. I think it's mostly cardboard objects that they've painted and then uh, built these scenes into. And I haven't seen a whole lot of stop motion or any so far um, built in the engine. It's, it's really cool to see something else. I think they're doing a really wonderful job trying something different and just 
uh, this fun, quirky environment, and uh, it's just, it's neat. It's neat, guys. Check it out. Thanks for joining the News and Community Spotlight. Hey guys, welcome to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott, and with me I have our Director of Engine Marketing, Nick Pidmorton, and floating up here is James Golding, Lead Programmer, joining us from Guildford. Hello. Yep. Uh, All right. Director of Engine Development. I'm sorry. I actually, actually know nothing about marketing. Oh, so. wow. My, <laughs> That's my, just not true, Nick. <laughs> we, you know, you're versatile, right? You just want to come join our department sure. and hang out with us. Of course. <laughs> but... Uh, so today we're going to be going over 419, which is available in the launcher for download, for the preview at least. Um, <laughs> and that way you can check it out, see what features are coming in. We definitely recommend you giving it a shot. Don't move your permanent project in quite yet. Uh, it's all in development, not necessarily ready for your final project. But uh, yeah. yeah. Not quite stable yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> Indeed. So yeah. Yeah, I guess. We'll just take it, take it from here and talk about 4.19. Um, so a lot of new exciting features coming in 4.19, of course. Um, we've been working a lot uh, on engine optimizations and, and stuff like that as well um, uh, for uh, Fortnite, as well as all of uh, every Unreal game, really. All the, all the work we do there makes it into, uh, into the engine itself. So uh, really exciting time. Uh, Let's get started with the features, I guess. Can we swap over to the, yeah. there we go. Cool. Um, so the first thing I was gonna talk about is a feature called temporal upsampling. It's a new rendering feature where uh, basically what it lets us do is render the 3D uh, scene at a lower resolution and then we um, accumulate that and uh, resample it temporarily at a higher resolution. And so this is a really effective way to render a high resolution image at, uh, at a much lower cost. So this is kind of illustrating the, how the resolution changes as we render a, a 3D frame. So we have sort of the, the original 3D resolution where we render the view geometry, we do depth of field, then we do the temporal upsampling, um, and then we do some amount of post-processing at this resolution. Uh, so motion blur, bloom, tone mapping, and then we have a, a secondary spatial upscale that you can also use. Um, so in previous engine versions, the screen percentage that was available was the spatial upscale at the end. And of course, we always render the UI at, at actual output resolution. Um, so this is really effective for rendering at, say, 4K output, where you don't want to render at actually 4K. But you can render at something like 1080p, a little bit above 1080p, something like that, and then upsample to uh, to 4K. Um, so we had just kind of a, um, an example here. Let's see if this actually oh. works. Uh, it doesn't work. Oh, the There's a video, a but I couldn't figure out how to play. Um, you just have to trust me. <laughs> um, check it out when you get a chance. And um, basically what you can see is that um, this is actually rendered at half resolution and then temporarily upsampled to uh, to full resolution. And so there's kind of a zoom in of the chain link fence and so on. You can kind of see how it's not uh, it's not super blurry like you would expect if it was actually rendered at half resolution. Yeah, I've seen the other image of this and it's just real, like you can't even hardly tell that's a, a power light or a thing yep. there just because it's so blurry and you're just like, what is happening there? And so it does a really wonderful job of crisping that up. Uh, let's see. So the other thing that this unlocks for us is dynamic resolution scaling. Um, so what this allows us to do is we can dynamically change that first resolution. Uh, so in this example, um, this is just kind of a frame rate chart from the Infiltrator demo, actually, where we turned it on and we allowed the, um, uh, the resolution to scale between uh, 200% and 70%, so actually doing a little bit of super sampling here. Um, and then you can see as, like, there was a camera cut, and so you see that huge spike in uh, in frame time, and then you can see that uh, 
that little graph down by two is actually showing you what uh, what resolution it's rendering at. And so that's kind of, uh, you'll see it drop down really quickly and then you'll see it go back up and, and start uh, compensating and it stays at a pretty solid 30 FPS. Uh, let's see, James, do you wanna talk about LiveLink? Sure. So, um, uh, so LiveLink is at its core, this feature we've been working on for a while, that's all to do with streaming animation data into the engine. And there's a bunch of things you can do with that. Um, this is sort of a big release for that for that feature. Um, so uh, one of the things we have in this release is proper um, release for our Maya plugin for LiveLink. So what that allows you to do is if you're animating in Maya, you can connect it to the engine. And as you animate in Maya, you'll see the results in the engine. So if you've got a bunch of complicated materials or like physics or clothing on that you can't see in Maya, you can see it in the engine. So in this little GIF we're doing here, we've got some Maya viewports. Uh, we also synchronize the camera. So as you move the Maya camera around, it also moves the camera in the engine. Even if you switch windows, it'll automatically update the camera. So that's one cool workflow that we've been using here is our animators can now animate in Maya on one screen and see the preview in the engine right away on the other screen. So that's one piece. Um, also, if, you, if you're doing sort of more professional motion capture, we have a Motion Builder plugin that will stream from Motion Builder into the engine. We're going to be making that available soon. That's in testing right now. And we're going to probably release the source um, for that as well. Um, we've also done some things, you know, like I said, syncing up the camera. Um, we've made it really easy to preview. So you just select a mesh and say, I want to use the, um, the Live Link camera. And then also, we're trying to make this really easy for other developers to work on. So if you've got any other kind of system, there's lots of really cool peripherals out there um, which allow you to, um, you know, in your own home, get get motion capture data, whether it's from a Connect or um, so. There's some awesome um, sort of Kickstarters and things which have had uh, cool devices for this. And so we want to make it really easy for people to get animation data into the engine. We've had lot, talked to lots and lots of people who've been trying to do this, and they haven't quite figured out the right way to do it. And we're going to come up with some really good docs, and um, this has made it a lot easier to get data in. So we're super excited about the engine as kind of this um, hub for getting different kinds of data into. And so it, you could either be cameras or moving lights around, moving cameras around. Anytime you want to stream that data into the engine live, and you can always record it in sequencer as well, um, it just makes for a really a really powerful set of set of tools. So that's sort of uh, officially out in in four nineteen. So that's a big a big deal there. So, so they're asking this is specifically a Maya plugin, but is there plans to introduce something like this for three DS Max or Blender? Um, we haven't worked on that at the moment, but it would certainly be you know that's the kind of thing we'd love to see people put on the marketplace. There's no way that we can write plugins for every right. motion capture system and, and 3D package and whatever. But what we're hoping is um, we, it, there's really not much code to write to do this. And so we'd love it if someone in the community, you know, does the same thing for, you know, takes that code and then does the same thing for um, uh, for Max or Blender or these other packages. And basically there's like two parts. There's, uh, you can either stream using our protocol into the engine, or if you've already got some kind of streaming protocol, a lot of like motion capture systems and other, other packages have a system, have a protocol, and then you can just write a plugin on the engine side to to understand that that stream of data, um, so yeah, we, we certainly want to support the community in doing that stuff. So um, you know, let us know if uh, if you hit problems. Awesome. Cool. Proxy LOD. Do you want me to hit this one? Um, let's see. Uh, I can talk about this one. I think we have a lot of animation features that you're going to be talking about. So <laughs> sure. uh, let's see. So proxy LOD. Um, we've had support for a similar sort of feature in the engine for a while that relies on SimplyGon. The whole concept here is that we take uh, a bunch of meshes that you have placed in the scene, and we create a simplified set of geometry and a simplified texture, simplified material to apply to it so that we can render the whole thing in a single draw call. Um, so we use this, for instance, um, we use them both Paragon and Fortnite to render parts of the environment that are very far away from the camera. So you get far away enough from uh, from a point of interest, and we just have a single draw call that can render an entire city or or something like this. So in this uh, sample scene, um, we've got you know a bunch of meshes here and uh, 25 different pieces of geometry, and we're able to render a, a reasonable approximation of it with a with a single draw call. Um, and so the nice thing about this is that it's built right into the engine, you no third-party software required or anything like that. This is coming in as experimental, so it's kind of at the first stage where we want people to try it out, give us feedback, let us know what doesn't work, let us know what um, what features you might need in addition to uh, to what we've implemented so far. But uh, but I'm really excited to get something out that uh, that everybody is able to use. Yeah, because we found this such a core piece of, of all of the games we make. If you're making an open world game or something like that, you definitely need features like this. And so it's really awesome to have this available to 
to everyone who uses the engine as a standard standard part of the engine. Um, and it's also it's just a really powerful. I mean, I think on the next slide actually, um, there's uh, it sort of talks about that we don't have to go through all the details, but it's quite a complicated process to go from a set of meshes into this sort of single mesh proxy. Um, and so it's kind of a cool set of features in the engine. So over time, you might you know um, expose more of those as individual pieces that people could sort of build their own tools with. But it's a really powerful set of kind of geometry processing. Um, yeah, tools definitely. I could see some of the things. tools for like baking materials or reprojecting materials onto a new piece of geometry. You know, th there are a lot of other tools that um, could be built on top of these building blocks. Um, just a small one, um, but we've got this tool called the Auto Convex tool, um, which you can take an, an arbitrary mesh and build simplified collision for it. It sort of does its best. Um, this was kind of clunky before. First of all, it took a while, and it also um, you gave it like an error threshold, and you'd let it crunch away, and then you see what it looked like, and you twiddle a bit and try again. Um, we changed it now, so uh, we've got a new version of this library that we use, um, and it now lets you specify the number of holes you want, and it also does it in the background, so you can set it off, and the ed editor is still responsive while it works it out. So. Um, hopefully that will uh, smooth. Um, uh, this was certainly popular with some of our artists, so hopefully that will be be helpful to people. Uh, this is kind of a cool feature we added. Um, so we've had clothing for a while, been working on our sort of old, own pipeline of that for sort of the last year or so. Um, one feature we added this time, which is pretty pretty fun to play with, is is clothing drive, which basically allows uh, you to set. Uh, the clothing to try and get to the animated pose. So if you've already got sort of bones, uh, vertices in the cloth weighted to, to bones, you can pose those bones. Let's say you've got a particularly dramatic uh, thing you want the clothing to do on a particular move. You can now um, have it using springs. It actually tries to achieve that pose. And so you can actually get some of the animated look of the cloth into the simulation. So it's not just purely simulation. It's actually attempting to reach an animated goal. So it gives you a lot more control. That's another another fun thing to play with when you're trying to get a particular look out of out of clothing. And so in this example, the, the animation is just a rotation, and then it's kind of interpolating in between the two and trying yep. to. Yeah. So what we've got here is, um, as you say, it's like a flat sheet that's rotating. And so what we're doing is we're turning the drive on and off. So when the drive's on, it, it sucks up to the top. Uh, basically, it's like a set of springs that lift that cloth to the, to the top. And then when we turn the drive off, it falls back down over the, uh, over the ball again. So it's, uh, it's pretty powerful. And you, you know, you've got a lot of control over that. Um, we've made some improvements to our animation tools. Um, we keep keep working on that. It, they're tools that our internal team use all the time, and so we get a lot of feedback on that. Um, a couple of the, the nice things we did, um, you can now lock the camera to a bone. This is really useful if you're doing, say, facial animation. You want to be able to just keep an eye on the face um, while an animation is going on, so you can lock the camera. Um, that's the top whole picture there. Um, we also allow you to have multiple viewports now, so you could sort of combine these things and have one viewport focused on the face, another one maybe locked to the hips, another one watching from a distance. So. Um, just, you know, lots of quality of life things. We're always trying to make people's lives easier and uh, uh, make people more productive in the engine. Um, another thing we added is the idea of pinnable options. Um, we don't have a picture for that, but there's a lot of neat options that people use a lot in the menus. And people were saying they were spending a lot of time digging through the menus to find the particular options they wanted to do. And now you can basically choose an option and add it as a button on the top so it's very quick to get to. Oh yeah, I saw that feature and like a video of that. And it looks so handy because it just brings exposure yeah, can... to them and makes it speeds up your workflow and you're not digging through menus. Yeah, it's amazing. Like when you, you know, knock out these little things. I mean, we always try and find time each release to to work on these kinds of quality of life stuff because it really does just, you know, it can double the productivity of someone, which is a big deal. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about audio. Um, we've been continuing to work on the new audio engine. Um, and there's some of the things that we've been able to work with partners to unlock there. Um, one of them is audio spatialization plugins. There's a bunch of companies we're working really closely with, um, Valve with the Steam Audio and with Oculus and with Google. Um, they're they are all really interested in these kind of spatialization plugins, which means uh, how do you play sounds to make them sound like they're actually in an environment? How do you take into account reflection and occlusion and those kinds of things? And so um, they all want to integrate into the engine. And with the new audio engine, it's much easier for them to, to integrate at a really low level and do this kind of um, signal processing work. So. Um, this is still all very experimental. You know that the new audio engine is not sort of fully enabled yet. It's something that we're continuing to um, to, to to work on and, and and work through all the issues, make sure it's really solid on every platform before we before we flip it on. But we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that it's allowed our partners to do now that it's in there and they can work with it. So we've got new versions of all of these integrations, and we've also got a thing called Ambisonics, which is um, a format where you can bring in audio that's not just like stereo, but actually has sort of 
above and below audio channels as well. So you bring in multiple channels from all different locations and you can place that in an environment. It's really good for sort of um, VR type applications. That's where that's the drive of a lot of these things is you really notice it when you're in VR, um, having sound propagate properly through the environment. And uh, Ambisonics is another one of those features that um, a lot of these, these uh, uh, plugins wanted to be able to support and now we've got engine support for as well. Uh, another quick audio thing. Um, uh, hang on a sec. Where is it? Sorry, it's cutting off the top of the slide for some reason. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, VoIP. Um, so we've had voice over IP for a while. Um, it's never been uh, amazing. And we've had a lot of people wanting to make, um, again, sort of VR type experiences where we were actually placing the audio in the, in the environment. Um, and now we've got much better support for that. So we can um, uh, you know, do proper spatialization and reverb and those kinds of things on, on the voice over IP um, uh, sources. So that's, that's pretty great for those kinds of applications. Uh, next one. Um, simple one, but uh, and another thing, because we, you know, with the new audio engine, we have sort of the low level data about the, um, uh, about the audio. Uh, we can now quite easily get, say, the envelope for it. So it's a small feature, but it's, 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 it allows you to do some nice things where in real time you can basically get in blueprints or in, in code the sort of amplitude of the, of the sound. So you could use that in a material. You could use that to change the scale of a mesh or something if you wanted to. You know, so this kind of couples quite well with the microphone one where you could imagine different speakers in the virtual environment um, you know, lighting up or um, uh, scaling. We've done some little tests, and, and it's, quite, it's quite powerful. <laughs> My caption. Uh, yeah, so we've we've also added uh, microphone um, capture as a prime as a uh, sort of first class feature of the new audio stuff. And so uh, again, you know, you can put all these pieces together, right? So you can uh, you know, capture the microphone at real at runtime or send it over the network uh, and sort of get the information about the microphone stuff. So um, yeah, we've definitely been hearing from a lot of um, partners who are building sort of VR applications on the engine, and, and audio is a huge part of, of VR and wants to continue to add hooks to make those really immersive. See encryption. Um, so uh, we've supported encrypting bits of the pack file for quite a while now, and we're exposing it in an easier to use um, way. So you can generate encryption and signing keys in the editor, and then choose what parts of your content you want to encrypt. Um, so this is really just about trying to prevent people from uh, data mining through pack files in your game, like. Um, not being able to find secret content that you meant to be hidden or um, maybe content that's supposed to ship in a later version or uh, being able to change content, you know, implementing wall hacks and stuff like this by hacking the content. Um, so you can choose to different um, types of files. So like just INI files or just the pack index or just USF files, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, definitely one of those things that's kind of useful when it's time to uh, time to ship your game to the public. Let's see, call stack display. You want to talk about that, James? Um, sure. We've added um, a few other uh, nice features to Blueprints. Um, uh, this one, when you get a breakpoint, um, sometimes it was hard to tell. Well, how did I get to this breakpoint? You know, it, it was. It's fine that you're there, but where? How did I get here? Um, and so now there's another um, tab you can summon in the sort of uh, developers menu. Um, which allows you to, when you hit a breakpoint, it'll actually show you how you got there. So in this case, you know, you fired something and some native code happened. Uh, then there was, you know, then it called into the gun again. Then some other C++ code happened, and then it came out uh, into this trigger pulled event, which then called something on the VR pawn. So you can basically see how it got to this uh, this this point, and that can help you very quickly nail down problems and and that kind of thing. So it's something that we've had in you know C++ debuggers for a while. We're trying to really make those blueprint tools. Um, really powerful and, and quick to, to figure out problems. Uh, and similarly, we've added some more um, stepping improvements. So you can not just like step forwards. You can, if you're on a um, like a return node, like shown here, you can easily step out of that. Um, you know, so if you're if you're buried inside functions, just getting around is is much quicker. So again, quality of life stuff, but it can make a big difference uh, when you're using this stuff every day, which I know a lot of our developers are. Uh, yeah, and we have some new uh, or improved tools for looking at size of content. So like, this is another thing when you're shipping a game and you're trying to optimize for memory, trying to figure out where is memory going, where my pack file is two gigabytes, right? Where, where did that all go? Um, this provides a good visualization of what's going where, um, giving you an idea of 
why is this texture in here? Why is this texture, you know, 20 megabytes, stuff like this. Um, so again, some of those tools that will um, help people during uh, shipping their projects. And this one also shows how it breaks up into, into chunks as well. So you can kind of see, you know, with a lot of games now, you want to have some initial chunk which people can start playing, and then there's more content that downloads later, for example. And so uh, we're trying to make it easier to figure out, well, why is this content in this bit rather than the other bit? See, the level sequence transform. So I believe that basically the idea here is you have a, a sequence in the level, and you want it to be relative to something else, so you can kind of move it around and... and uh, uh, yeah. yeah, you can you know even change it? it on the fly. So you can have yeah. a, a level sequence that would play out off some point. So in this example, there's that white box, which is sort of the origin for this level sequence. But you can actually have, in the blueprint, you can move that around on the fly. So um, if you actually saw this running, that the guy walks from the white box across, but it's constantly moving where the white box is, and the whole sequence moves around on the fly. So um, it allows you to you know, have cinematics that can play out in different parts of the world procedurally. Um, which can be really powerful depending on the kind of game you're making. But this is just, you know, allowing the sequencer to um, give you more control over how it works in the game. Let's see, landscape rendering optimization. So this one, um, we've made some optimizations into how we distribute the triangles when selecting LOD for landscape. And there's some different options for, for choosing that. So rather than being purely distance based, um, it'll figure out for a particular portion of the landscape um, effectively what amount of the screen is is it covering and then choose an LOD that will um, have a, a good amount of triangles given that uh, screen space. Um, and that's sort of how you uh, how you tune it. The other optimization we implemented, which I think has been a, a long, long time requested feature, is the ability to only use tessellation shaders on the very nearby parts of the landscape. So as it LODs out, as it gets farther from the camera, we swap to shaders that don't use tessellation, um, which is a huge optimization if you're going to use um, tessellation materials on the landscape. Uh, so this will empower you to use um, displacement on a terrain um, while still achieving good, uh, good frame rates. Boulder favorites. You want to talk about that, James? Sure. I mean, it's, it's again, this seems like a small thing, but uh, it was greeted with with cheers uh, by our content teams. Uh, basically, the idea is you can uh, just right click on a folder now and choose add to favorites. And you can see there's a little tab up in the, uh, the top left there, which just shows your favorite folders. Um, and so oftentimes, if you're working on a particular character or a particular level, you'll have a few folders you're going to all the time. Um, and so you can spend a lot of time just like going back and forth between those folders. But now you can favorite them, and you can just very quickly jump between them all the time. Um, so this has been, you know, again, a big productivity win for uh, for folks when you just need to keep jumping back and forth between folders, between assets in different directories. Yeah, and along the lines of trying to make artists' lives better, um, some material parameters, uh, saving improvements. Um, so just a couple of features for being able to take all of the parameters for a particular material and save them off to either like a sibling instance or a child instance. Um, so if you've got a uh, material and you want to basically have something similar but tweak it a little bit, you can take these parameters and copy it over to um, a new uh, material that has the same uh, parent material and then tweak that a little bit there. Or same thing, create a new um, create a new child material but copy the parameters from this one. Um, so just some workflow things that uh, that our artists found really useful internally and hopefully uh, hopefully everybody will find useful. Um, and a new experimental feature are some new material layering tools. Uh, so here, a lot of times when we make uh, content, we build it by um, making individual material layers based on the type of material. So like leather, plastic, metal, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we mask in the different layers. So this allows us to achieve a very um, high effective texture resolution because um, all of the little individual layers are these really high tiling or high detail tiling textures. Um, and then we have a, a mass texture or logic in the material that determines how to blend between them. So what these tools allow you to do is that master material, you can actually swap in different layers where those layers are potentially different node graphs or um, 
the same set of nodes, but different material parameters, so different textures or different um, uh, different parameters. And then in a material instance, what you can do is swap out those material layers. So you can swap out the red plastic for leather or something like that. Um, so it's just a different workflow where before you would have to go and create a new graph and then drop the material layers into that graph and then do all the blending logic in the um, in the graph itself. Now you can set all that stuff up uh, right in the material instance itself. Um, so it allows you to be a much more efficient as well as you can build this base material that has a number of layers built in, maybe has some gameplay effects built into it. Um, and then the people building the materials that you're going to put on meshes don't have to worry about going into the node graph at all. Um, so super convenient. Uh, let's see, little one here from VR, basically uh, the ability to visualize the motion controller. So you can um, either have a custom mesh or um, you know default or uh, display like the Oculus controller. And that's that's it for the presentation. Actually, one thing, one other thing I know that's coming is um, the unified AR framework um, is something that's going to be ready for use in 419. Like, um, so this is basically exposing uh, all the important AR features from AR Kit, from AR Core, etc., in a unified way. So again, you can build one set of content and have access to those features on all platforms. Right, and it'll, it'll help you deploy to both, right? Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. So many things. Uh, real quick, I want to touch, you had the, you mentioned the material layering, but I don't know if you mentioned, but the forum, they actually have a forum post up about it, where there's some details about the material layering uh, setup, and if you, I'll drop the link in the chat, but they're also looking for feedback and how to make that better in the future, so if that's your thing, um, do check that out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, any other ones you want to mention before we go to some questions? Uh, no, I can just jump into questions. Unless, do you have anything else, James? No, I don't think so. I think that, right. that covers, uh, covers most of it. All As right. you say, there's always the millions of bug fixes and optimizations and everything else, but uh, people have to wait for the release notes to, <laughs> to dig through all those because we can't remember them all. That's Far right. too many. Way too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> the novel of fixes. Um, let's see. They're saying with temporal upscaling, if they use post-process, could they isolate it to an area such as a circle that is zoomed in and would otherwise be pixelated? So, um, No. So you can't choose the temporally upsample only a subset of the screen. It'll have to be the entirety of the screen. Um, you could probably do that with a scene capture. So like you could have a scene capture rendering at a certain resolution and choose to temporally upsample that mm -hmm. into a higher res texture and then uh, composite that in with a material post process. Right. See, um, going back to live link. So it's mostly, or is we're demonstrating as far as animations and stuff, is that gonna be possible for modeling or rendering and things across? Um, probably not for modeling at the moment. It does. It basically just sends a stream of uh, transforms and attributes. Um, so sending off sending geometry over was probably not something that's sort of on the cards at the moment. Um, but uh, but one thing I should mention is it can be used. It's not just an editor thing. It can be used at runtime. So if you, you know if you are building some application where you wanted to be able to um, uh, you know capture someone uh, or, or get some sort of animation data in you know some kind of um, for runtime use as well as editor time use, that would be that would be appropriate. You could definitely do that. Okay. Do, do, uh, they're wondering if there do we have any plans for web VR support? Web VR support. Uh, nothing I'm aware of. No. Okay. <laughs> That's more a question I think for um, for Nick Whiting. I think. Right. We don't have him here. Right. Nope. Um, Different Nick. They're wondering if the auto exposure bias option in post process volumes has gone away in 419. It's very specific. I don't know. <laughs> you seem so surprised. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wouldn't have expected that, although it might have changed with the physical light units change. 
um, which is something that's coming in 419 actually that uh, that I don't think was in the, the slides we were going through. Um, so that kind of changes how we're doing exposure. Um, but I think we still support, as far as I know, we still support right. auto exposure. In fact, I know we still support auto exposure. <laughs> Good. Yes. Um, let's see. With the landscape opt landscape optimizations in four nineteen, do you feel like that makes all of that VR ready? VR or, ready. Or does it? I mean. I mean, it helps it obviously. Yeah, it it helps with performance. So from that point of view, you'll be able to um, push it farther in terms of VR. Um, I mean, using landscape should have been possible, but maybe not at the quality level that you would really want for um, for VR titles. So it'll definitely help from that point of view. All right. Uh, oh, for the favorite folder favoriting, um, can you use it on both engine and plugin folders? Is it any folder? I I think so, but I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I yeah, I assume it it's much. any folder, but uh, seems like it should yeah. be. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're asking about the uh, future of destructibles. Ah, James. <laughs> um, so in four, I think it was four eighteen. We moved it out to a plugin, um, which is a really nice change for um, both sort of engine size and also sort of maintainability. It sort of makes things more modular. Um, we don't have any plans. We're not working on it at the moment. Um, it's not saying, you know, it is where it is right now. We, you know, we're sort of, it's in maintenance, but we're not continuing development at the moment, um, uh, in an active way. Um, it's something that we'd like to revisit, like the whole topic of at some point, but there's nothing sort of planned at the moment. So, um, there's nothing really to talk about uh, at the moment, but, uh, uh, it's certainly an area of interest for, for quite a few people, but, um, we'll have to see, see what the future holds. Yeah. I've had a lot of exciting discussions about, you know, where we could take destruction, where we might want to take it in the future, but. Um, but yeah, nothing coming in, in the next version or anything like that. All right. Uh, my computer froze. It's fun. <laughs> I can't get to your questions, guys. This is neat. <laughs> um, here. Do you want to use Can this I one? See? Yeah, we might be able to check if there's more. Oh, man. Technical difficulties. They're always an adventure. Um. So what are some of your, let's see, can you talk about real-time global illumination and the future thereof? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a big topic. Um, <laughs> there's still no great solution for that in my mind. Um, you know, it's an area of, of active research, but, um, but I think everything everything out there that's been promising requires some sort of pre-computation or some sort of trade-off um i mean voxel cone tracing is still still probably the most applicable for a fully uh fully dynamic environment with fully dynamic lighting but from a performance point of view it's just not ready yet Uh, let's see, any additional clothing tool improvements? Um, yeah, we, I mean, th those have continued to be under development. I'm going to see if I can check. I'm trying to find, I think I had some notes here. Now I can't find them. Hold on. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's been a few things on, on that front. Um, so as well as the sort of features we added, um, there's some nice things with the, the UI. You can sort of set vertex size. You can... Um, uh, it makes sure to use the physics asset properly. The visualizations are better when you're painting on things. The the range tools are nicer. So there's a, there's a bunch of polished things in the tools. Um, it's something that you know we use a lot um, internally, uh, so we get a lot of feedback on that stuff. Um, we we actually compiled a really good list from our from our tech animators, and we do hope to get to that. We, probably not in the 419 timeframe. It's sort of that that's passed, but maybe for 420 we'll get to some of those things. But we'll we'll see. It's certainly one of those things that because we use it a lot, we get a lot of feedback internally, and that's what's you know, our, the relationship with our internal teams is, is really helpful for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I see a question about whether all of the networking optimizations that we worked on for Fortnite or in 419. Um, so we had a blog post a while ago about a lot of the work we did when shipping Battle Royale 
And as I recall, I think like half of those changes are something made it in 418. The rest are all in 419. Um, since then, we've been constantly optimizing and improving the engine, um, both on the network side as well as the game thread side, rendering, console, pretty much across the board. So everything we talked about in that blog post is in 4.19. Um, and we've been continuing to do a lot of work since then, which um, uh, you can see in the main branch and more will continue to come in over time and be in 4.20. See, see. So someone's asking about if you'll get content examples on how to make good use of um, the audio plugins. And I think, I know the team's working on a lot of documentation. Are you aware of any samples that are being created? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. We, th there's, um, I don't quite know. Yeah, I, I sort of want to check with the audio team to, to be sure of exactly <laughs> what shape that's taking. But there's definitely, uh, we've been thinking for a while and working for a little while on some examples of that stuff, particularly um, sort of spatialization, what you can do with the engine as it currently is. Um, I think there's a lot of power there that people aren't necessarily aware of and, and know the best practices for. Um, I think we don't feel these days that like the samples we have sample games are, you know, they're not really um, great examples of, of the best you can get out of the engine. And so um, we're definitely working on some more samples uh, that will um, both show how to set up the engine as it currently is and also to make use of some of these plugins if, if you wanted to try those out in your game as well. So yeah, I don't know exactly the, the time for those, but it's definitely something I'm working on. I think we'll have something really cool in the next um, in the next not too distant future. Yeah, and I know we've been talking to those guys as far as um, once a lot of that documentation and stuff is ready, we'll mm -hmm. have Aaron on to come on a live stream and really walk through. He's really pumped about all the Im incredible work they're doing, and so he wants to jump Aaron, on excited? And, no. <laughs> and he's just, like, chomping at the bit, and he's like, okay, um, I'm ready to jump in, and he wants to share everything that they've been working on with you all, so that'll be coming. Let's see, there was, there's a specific question I saw. Something about um, whether there's a good reason why you can't sample custom stencil in an opaque material. Um, the answer is right now we render the custom depth stencil pass after the opaque pass. Uh, that one we don't depth test against the main pass. So I don't see why we couldn't move it around um, or I don't know, give it a, Give it a try in the source code. Try moving those passes around and let us know. I think next time we do this, we just need Visual Studio for you, Nick, so you can like yeah. fix bugs live. Real-time <laughs> yeah. programming. Okay, well. no problem. Yeah. Um, be awesome. Oh, yeah, there was. Let's see. What is the plan with Python script editor? Um, so we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so yeah, we, we want to be able to support um, being able to script the editor in general, but then we're adding support for Python scripting in particular. So um, as part of this, there's kind of two components where we're working on exposing more and more editor functionality to the scripting subsystem. Uh, so this actually, anything we expose there is also available to Blutilities. So you can take a blueprint and um, use that to script editor functionality. And then uh, in addition, we're supporting uh, Python scripting in the editor, since it's very common for, um, uh, for companies to script their pipelines with, uh, with Python to be able to get data from wherever, from other DCC tools, process it in some way, and then you know, potentially import it into the engine, place objects in the editor, build materials, stuff like that. Um, so it's under active development. It's um it's definitely not done but uh but it's on the way yeah I mean, we, we've certainly found working on titles recently um we've been making a lot of use of that internally like a lot of our artists have started building blueprints to work on assets and it's it's been really powerful as a way of um auditing a lot of assets or uh, making ch bulk changes to things in a more sensitive way um so yeah so i definitely think we're going to continue to push in that direction and expose more um more editor type functionality to, to scripting, whether it's Blueprint or, or Python. It's just a really efficient way for empowering our content guys. Uh, let's see. I see one. Uh, can proxy LOD work well with foliage? Um, I mean, it works OK. Uh, but uh, I think for something like foliage, there are much more effective ways to do LOD. Um, one of our tech artists at 
you've seen him many times. Ryan Brox came up with this sort of um, amazing imposter system for foliage that uh, maybe at some point we can get him to talk about it or do a um, a blog post on it. But um, uh, but it it's really cheap to render in the distance and the quality is really good. Um, as well as uh, it can actually um, the imposter writes out correct depth values so you can get good uh, shadows on it with like um, the contact shadows feature where it basically ray traces through the depth buffer looks really good. Yeah, I think one of those imposters is like um, the eight vertices, whereas you can't get anything close to that with a proxy log version of a tree because it's still going to try and keep the shape of the tree. So it's going to be 30 or 40 vertices at, at, at the very least. So um, yeah, the imposter stuff is definitely a great solution to that. So we'll try and share that in the future. Yep. Uh, let's see. When is there going to be correct depth sorting for translucent materials? So I'm guessing in this case, you're talking about actual per pixel sorted translucency. Um, so we depth sort on a, on a per material basis right now. And we haven't revisited that to look at, um, to look at implementing per pixel um, order independent translucency. We had a prototype of it really early on in UE4, but um, uh, I think it cost about six times more to, to turn it on. So on balance, we didn't think it was worth it to support. Um, something we might reevaluate in the future, but yeah, uh, not supporting at the moment. Let's see, there's Let's some see. question about the um, online subsystem. Are we working on any integrations there or? Uh, um, let's see, specifically talking about Steam, it looks like. Um, so we've been doing some updates on Steam. Uh, I don't know if they're going to make it into 419 or if they're more, there'll be more uh, 420 or potentially later time frame. But there, uh, there has been some recent active work on uh, on Steam in particular. Um, but I don't, I don't remember the details offhand. Let's see. Is volumetric lighting in its final stage? In the sense that we consider it a feature that we think is awesome and uh, and works well, yes. Um, I'm sure they'll will potentially work on improvements in the future, but um, but yeah, we definitely consider it final. Uh, we use it in Fortnite, actually, by the way, and uh, ship it on console as well. Um, someone's asking if the dynamic resolution only affects 3D renders, like the R screen percentage command and things. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, that way your your UI is always going to render at native resolution. It's just the um, the three D resolution that gets scaled. That thing does work incredibly well. I was checking it out on one of the graphics coders the other day, and it, it is witchcraft. I I don't understand how it can look as good as it does. It's surprising. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, they're wondering if there are plans to integrate a system to render more realistic hair. More realistic hair. Nothing right now. <laughs> um, I mean, we're always interested in um, one, one of the areas of sort of active research for us is continuing to push the barrier or continuing to push the boundaries of digital humans, um, rendering quality, animation quality, et cetera. So it's, it's definitely something we'll revisit at some point. But uh, we don't have anything going on today related to higher quality hair rendering or hair simulation. Um, there's a lot of questions I know about uh, Linux and if we're trying to work on oh, the launcher there. I saw something about Linux and Vulkan. So at the moment, um, no immediate plans to bring the launcher to Linux. Um, but we are actively working on, uh, on Vulkan, supporting it on uh, Windows, on Linux, and on Android. Uh, that's coming along nicely. Right now, we're in the middle of doing a lot of optimization to to just make sure that we can so, um, we can get parity between Vulkan and Direct Three D. Um, from a correctness point of view, point of view, it's there, but uh, we still need more optimization to get the performance up to par. Let's see, um, someone's asking any work done on LPVs and how possible is it to ship with it as is? Um, no. 
no work put into LPVs recently. Um, we're kind of keeping it working in its current state, but we're not uh, not currently developing it. In terms of shipping it, um, if the current set of functionality works for you, it um, go for it, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, there's you might run into LPV doesn't work with a particular other feature, or there might be a corner case bug that we're that we're missing that you should be prepared to fix. Any, are you going to see improvements in UMG? UMG, I mean, we're making UMG improvements all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, I think most recently, been working again on performance, kind of one of those things that, uh, that we hit every time we ship a game yeah. and um, trying to get the HUD time down to one millisecond or less and <laughs> always have to kind of go through and um, look for opportunities to make it faster. Um, so I know there's some good work going on there. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. IES profile support in the forward render. Um, not at this time. Um, so currently, uh, the current forward render, um, that feature set is basically um, from a lighting point of view, mostly what we're supporting. As we add new features, if we can support it in both deferred and, and forward, we add it to both. But um, uh, but we haven't looked at bringing IS profiles to forward. Let's see. Does volumetric indirect lighting work with level streaming in 419? Volumetric indirect? Do you mean volumetric light maps, maybe? That could be, I don't know. Um, I know that was a problem with the first implementation. I th I'm pretty sure it works. Um, pretty sure we fixed that for 419. But, uh, but um, I'd have to follow up on that. <laughs> um, all right. Any more questions? Get them in. Anything in the works to open up client-side prediction for use outside of the character movement component, such as network physics actors? Mm. I think um, it's, specific. <laughs> it's something that we've definitely heard for a while. Um, it's, it's tricky. We've had a few conversations. I think. Um, We'd like to do something with physics replication, at least make that a little bit better. I think full prediction is pretty hard with physics, um, so I'm not sure we might go that whole route. Um, so I think you'll probably see at least some improvements in physics replication, um, but you might not see um, like a fully open uh, client prediction system for anything you could possibly do. It's quite a hard thing to, to do because you sort of have to rewind and replay you know, any action that could have happened. So. Um, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll see some improvements uh, maybe on the physics side, but, but I don't think there's anything more general at the moment, but it's definitely something that we are aware is, is quite hard coded at the moment and we'd like to, to get to in the future. All right. Let's see, what other questions? I think we've covered a lot of those. Uh, Blender and Unreal integration. Um, don't know, not really on uh, on the roadmap. Do we have plans uh, on making world rebasing or shifting working with um, huge open world online projects? It's kind of a big question. <laughs> um, um, I mean, that was, it's actually kind of the point of that feature. So it works, it does cause a hitch when it happens um, because we basically have to, in a single frame, go and move every actor in the world to a new origin, um, as well as like every particle that's in world space needs to go and translate. Like it's, um, it's a pretty expensive operation. So uh, it, it does work. Um, I think you might be talking about uh, dedicated server. Maybe you can't use it with dedicated servers. Do you know, James? <laughs> I think that might be a restriction on the system right now. 
I mean, normally, hmm. The client definitely can. Depending on what kind of game you're making. But, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that there's, you know, it's, it's something that we definitely have been supporting. And I've, I, I know that I fixed at least one bug with cable components and rebasing in 419. So I think uh, uh, it's definitely maintained and people are testing it. But I don't know of any particular issues. Um, certainly, yeah, it's definitely a supported feature. about the end of our hour so i'm gonna wrap it up a couple comments um as always submit your projects to our nvidia edge program it's your chance to win a 1080 ti and for doing some sweet projects um we have our winter ue4 jam kicking off next week so uh if game jams are your thing you can participate win sweet prizes from intel and houdini and a ton of our uh, Marketplace community folks have offered up some lovely packs and of assets, animations, characters, things like that. So join in, tune in, check that out, and I'll drop a survey link so you can let us know what you'd like to work on or what you'd like to see in our future streams because we're always wanting to know. Uh, it's all about what you want to see. So um, thank you both for joining in and talking about all the wonderful features that are upcoming in 419 there's a, a lot of, cool. a lot of amazing stuff coming out so keep your eyes on it and uh yeah cool. thanks for tuning in yeah, yeah. thank you very much bye guys it was fun bye to everyone bye-bye awesome.